Hello, everybody. This is Ask the Doctor. This is our effort to try and get you the most credible medical information that we can. It's a partnership of Editor G and Twitter. And obviously, the need for credible information from the top doctors in the country and the world is very much there. Uh, this series has already crossed 11 million views overall. Each one of these episodes gets nearly a million views, and that just shows how much people really need that information. Uh, if you have any questions to ask the doctors, just tweet them to us at Editor G at Twitter India with hashtag Ask the Doctor. And by the way, if you want to watch any of the previous episodes, we've done 12, 13 of these already on a range of subjects ranging from treatment to vaccination to mental health to what issues children or women should be dealing with. Just uh, You can just get the Editor G app and all previous episodes are there. But today on this particular show, two guests who really struck a chord, I have to say, in some of the previous uh, episodes that we did. Uh, Dr. Arvinder Soin, who's uh, not just, it just indicates how much we're getting into COVID that I can actually pronounce that name by now, Dr. Soin. When we started, I couldn't even think of pronouncing it, but now, yes, I can. And Dr. Harj Mahajan, founder, chief radiologist of Mahajan Imaging, but he's also the president of Nat Health. And in case well, you're wondering what that is, that's sort of the apex body which all medical companies, medical associations, they're all are coming into this and they're trying to coordinate their efforts. So it's a real privilege to have both of you with us. Dr. Mahajan, perhaps I could just start with you uh, to get a sense of where we are because, okay, we're this much into the pandemic now. We are hearing cases start to fall. Deaths are still at a record high, but I guess you would expect that to happen because there's a lag between cases and deaths and recovery. So deaths are at a record level. Anecdotally, in some places like Mumbai and Delhi and Maharashtra, it seems that things are getting better, but in other places it could be getting worse. What's your overall sense? I'm going to throw that same question to Dr. Sohan as well. Thank you very much, Vikram, for having me on this show. And uh, yes, very rightly you said that uh, even though the deaths yesterday were the maximum ever, we crossed uh, 4,500. But that's generally a reflection of uh, the number of cases that were there two weeks ago, 14 days ago. So that, so there is this lag. But if we look at the number of cases, if we look specifically at Delhi, from about 29, 30,000, which we had at the peak, today I think we have less than 4,000. It's about 3,600 or so. And more importantly, the test positivity rate is at about 5.6%, which again shows that the numbers are going down. Uh, the but Dr. Hospitals, Mahajan, let me just interrupt yes. you. There are some people who will ask this question. There are some people who will ask this question that is it going down because not enough testing is happening? Is it going down because there's a lockdown so there's an artificial curbing of how bad the situation is? As soon as the lockdowns end, as soon as as soon as step, uh, testing steps up, then suddenly it's going to be a lot worse. There's also going to be this question about whether uh, antigen tests are taking place and not RT-PCR. Let me address all those issues. Number one, the lockdown has helped because it has uh, brought down the cases. And frankly, to a large extent, it is because of this lockdown which was soft to begin with and has become stricter probably in the last 10, 12 days. And we have another five days to go for the lockdown. This has helped because congregations haven't happened. Pe lesser people have gone to offices. You know, the uh, metro trains have stopped. The buses are very few. So the that is the very, uh, you know, reason why we have a lockdown. And this has helped. Now, the number of tests have gone down. Of course, it was during this lockdown only that we had the maximum number of tests done and the maximum, uh, you know, positivity rate and the maximum number of uh, cases in Delhi, if we talk specifically of Delhi. But as because of the lockdown, lesser people are getting infected, lesser people are symptomatic. So lesser people are even coming to get their tests done. And hence the numbers have gone down. Uh, okay. As a consequence okay. of that. And uh, okay. uh, uh, yes. And thirdly, you know, the number of tests that are done and the positivity rate, you know, even if you do lesser number of tests, 
and the positivity remains high, then you can say, oh, there's something wrong. It's because the testing has gone down. Now we are picking up lesser absolute numbers. But the percentage going down means that in absolute terms also, the numbers are going down, even if you're testing lesser. All right, Dr. Avi Swain, let me ask you about the status. And I also am going to try and broaden this, not just obviously Delhi or Mumbai don't represent the entire country. There will be this constant fear that what's happening in urban India or Mumbai or Delhi doesn't really reflect what's happening uh, outside. What's your overall sense, though, of how things are going? Because the last time, Dr. Swain, you were on, it was looking like there was an apocalypse all around us. Uh, is it better now? And if it's better now, is it only in places like Delhi and Mumbai or, you know, Chhattisgarh and some places where it's better or is it better everywhere? So Vikram, as we see things sitting in Delhi NCR and also in my hospital at Medanta, the number of crisis calls, the number of uh, admissions, the pressure for admissions is definitely less now than it was three weeks ago. So the numbers are definitely down. And as we have uh, all discussed uh, a little earlier, uh, the, the recoveries and deaths will take time to show up. So what's showing up today is actually from the infection that happened a couple of weeks ago. But the numbers are definitely coming down. But there is this lurking fear inside me and a lot of other people that there may be pockets of COVID uh, coming up or, or actually uh, getting worse in the rural areas. And I hope we are not missing them because they don't have access to testing. And we understand that in the first wave, the rural population largely escaped, except for the migrant workers who actually got, you know, some of them got infected. But this time around, we are all aware of lots and lots of deaths happening in villages. Uh, you know, fellow citizens and people who work with us often tell us about their villages having masses of people with fever. So I am a little afraid that this might be an illusion and there may be some pockets of infection in the rural areas which we need to rule out and that must happen at the state and district level and they have to make sure that the rural population is counted and protected. Okay, Dr. Mahajan, uh, from your various members whom you must be speaking to outside Delhi, the, the fear that Dr. Soin is expressing is obviously the, in any one of these waves, different states have peaked at a different time, right? So you had Maharashtra, then you had, you know, Maharashtra, Kerala, then Delhi, then uh, now it seems to be Karnataka. Uh, maybe it's going to move now to Tam into Tamil Nadu, West Bengal. So the overall national picture, and with the big concern, would you agree with Dr. Soin that the big concern may be rural India, where there could be deaths taking place, there could be hundreds and thousands of cases, and no one really knows about them? I think uh, Dr. Soin has put it very correctly. And, uh, you know, uh, disease spreading in the rural areas is a matter of concern. And it does appear from uh, uh, what we see the media present that uh, there is disease which has spread to the rural areas. And as rightly said, there's no testing there. Uh, there are families uh, who are uh, losing their lives. We had this, uh, you know, uh, uh, visuals of, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of bodies lining along the Ganga, uh, yeah. you know, buried in uh, loosened. And uh, so there is this uh, thing that is happening. And you've uh, very rightly said that there is a geographical distribution to the wave. It, it start, started from Kerala, Maharashtra, and then it was Punjab, Delhi, and so many others. Currently, the situation is that about 1920 states, it has been going down. And uh, 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 it is actually going down. It is no fudging of numbers that's happening. And in some of the northeastern states and in Bengal, as well as in Karnataka, Kerala, uh, um, uh, um, Andhra Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu, the numbers are actually going up. In, in Karnataka, in Bangalore, they are coming down. But overall, there's still a large uh, chunk of, of patients who are there. And, and this follows, uh, you know, the same pattern uh, as... India was behind the West in the first wave. Similarly, we were behind the West in the second wave. And India is actually a federation of states. And that's how it has happened here as well. Okay. 
Right, let me start taking now questions. A whole bunch of questions are pouring in on Twitter for you, so I'm going to start taking them. Here's, here's one question that uh, uh, I'm going to take. Um, new recommendations coming from the government on, on vaccination, right, and what, what should be done has been not been accepted. Um, get vaccinated three months after recovery. Uh, you can give plasma 14 days after recovery, and vaccination is fine for lactating mothers. I'm just going to ask this to both of you because by now there have been so many different guidelines. Quite frankly, I'm confused by now. So, Dr. Soin, your recommendation. When should you have the first dose? When should you have the second dose? What do you do when you are recovering? What do you do if you're not recovering? Like, it's, a, it's confusing. So, the first dose is simple. All adults should have their first dose if they can lay their hands on it. Uh, if you've had a COVID infection, the current recommendation, the initial recommendation, I think about a week ago, was that you have to wait for six months. But then there is this new recommendation of three months, and I think this is valid both for the first dose and the second dose. So let me uh, kind of dissect it a little. So it seems that you have to wait for three months, according to the latest recommendation, after your COVID infection. And if you've had one jab, and then the COVID infection, then again, you have to wait three months to get the second jab. So I think that's as far as the recommendations stand today. In terms of spacing of vaccines, we are all aware that the interval has been gradually increased from four to eight to 12 to now 12 to 16 weeks for COVID shield. And it is currently standing at four to six weeks between the two doses of the Covaxin. And there, there has to be no mixing of vaccines, although there have been studies uh, in Spain and UK, but in India, you have to take the same first and the second doses. Mm. All right, that's, that's uh, uh, Dr. Bhatia, anything you want to write to them? I'm just seeing another flash of the coming in. People with other serious illnesses requiring hospitalization or ICU care can also wait for four to eight weeks before getting the vaccine. That's what uh, people are asking, that what exactly does this mean? Anything else you'd like to add to what Dr. Soin said about what people should I think Dr. Soin, uh, Dr. Soin has put it very, very clearly. So if you have an infection, the US uh, CDC recommendation forever has been that you take your next jab, whether it's the first or the second, after three months, 90 days. And that's what the government has now recommended. Previously, it was four weeks, six weeks, but now it's 90 days. And, and there's science behind it that you do have enough antibodies for three months after you get infection. And that's why if you need a booster, get it after that. Now, uh, 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 what was the other other question you just asked? Uh, essentially, essentially, the question is whether people with other serious illnesses, oh, right, whether yeah. they should be waiting to get the vaccine. That's what I think uh, the government has now clarified that wait for four to eight weeks in case that's... That's a when you have uh, other illness of say you have fever or you have typhoid or you have some nature of acute illness you know let's not confuse it with the uh, you know chronic illness like diabetes or hypertension or coronary artery disease or someone having seizures those are all illnesses you can still go ahead and uh, you know get your jab as planned where it is a acute illness it is worth waiting at least four weeks before you recover completely, and then you get the jab. Okay. Ashita Datta's question, can lactating mothers take the vaccine? If yes, is it true that antibodies will pass on to the baby if the mother gets vaccinated? Now that, um, from what I can un see and understand from the new guidelines, Dr. Soin, yes, well, lactating mothers should, get, should take the vaccine. Yes, absolutely. Lactating mothers can take the vaccine, and yes, the antibodies that go into the mother will definitely be passed on to the baby as well. Okay. Dr. Mahajan, the standard question which I'm continuing to see is, when is everyone going to get vaccinated? What's the point of saying get vaccinated? I've been trying, someone's asking this question, many people asking this question. We've been trying to log on for days and days and days. We just can't get a slot. When are things going to open up? When will it be possible for us to get vaccinated? And I think well, it's very important for me. Yeah, Vikram, the situation is very fluid, as you know, that there is a finite amount of uh, vaccine that's available in the country. Uh, currently, what uh, uh, Covishield, you know, Serum Institute makes anything between 60 to 70 million uh, doses a month. 
and uh, Bharat Biotech, that is Covaxin, is about 10 to 20 million. So all you have at the maximum is about 90 million doses a month from indigenous sources. Now, that is why there is this hunt uh, for uh, the states. Now, they are all uh, floating global tenders, fighting with each other to get that vaccine. And uh, it's very difficult to say when uh, it will be available. What the government has said, that about 300 million doses will be available till August during this time. Uh, through a combination of indigenous production. As you uh, know, the Sputnik V is also going to be manufactured in-house. And there is attempt by the central as well as the state governments to import it in. These are the only three vaccines that are currently granted emergency but use it's approval. Not, it's not, of course... Um... It's not, of course, enough, unfortunately, right? 300 million. Not at all. We should be actually, we, yeah. we should be actually, you know, at the very least, we should be uh, uh, doing about uh, 70 million jabs, uh, seven, uh, 7 million uh, 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 jabs uh, a day. That's 210 in a month. Uh, yeah. We just don't have the vaccine for it. And that's why, you know, many people feel that this opening up of the 18 to 45 year uh, uh, group may have been a little premature because there are those who are still waiting for their second jab and in line. And now, like you said, it's like a fastest finger first. But uh, there are different uh, slots, like so maybe that will happen. I, I, I guess a real problem is just that these doses weren't ordered or, you know, soon enough. And now, um, Dr. Sain, any any suggestions that you might have for how things can be speeded up? Obviously, vaccine hesitancy is no longer the problem. I keep still seeing people saying, how can you encourage people to go out and get the vaccine? I don't think that's the problem. I think everyone wants, enough people want to get the vaccine. The problem is, whereas we can probably vaccinate people, 7 million to 10 million people a day is what we could probably be vaccinating, jabs and arms. The actual supply of vaccines is closer to 2 million a day. So therefore, that's the gap. And it's not very clear how that gap will be bridged till at least August, maybe September. Um, unless mm. you have a really good idea on how to do it. Because even if you say step up manufacturing, now the raw material is also tough to get to. And, you know, that's going to become a bottleneck as well. So, Vikram, we've discussed this before, you and I. And uh, we are clear, like Harsh correctly pointed out, that uh, 7, 8 million a day uh, for the next five, six months will see us give about a about a billion doses to our citizens. And that roughly uh, equates to how much Israel and perhaps UK have done to beat the pandemic. At least it looks like that at the moment. So it's going to be OK from August onwards because we know that we're going to manufacture about, I think, about uh, 17 crore vaccines a month from August onwards between uh, Serum Institute and Bharat Biotech. It's the time between now and August that worries me. And the obvious answer is to import vaccines, whether it is Sputnik or even J&J, &J, and of course the mRNA vaccines. The Pfizer and the government story keeps appearing uh, in the news every two or three weeks. I wonder what's happening there. But I mean, if we can get some vaccines from them, if we can get some of the stock that's there in the in countries like UK, Canada, uh, France, US, who have overordered. I mean, they're sitting on between three and six doses per person. If you can get some of those vaccines across to countries where there are less, like India. So those would be the obvious solutions. The other thing we mustn't do is what we did between the first and the second wave. You know, as it seems now, there is probably going to be a third wave because there is still large, large swaths of uh, Indian population who haven't been exposed to the infection. So that third wave is probably going to happen in the next three to six months. And that's okay. why we've talked about vaccinating people in those few months. But if and until that happens, you have to have to make sure there are no congregations and crowds. OK, here's a question for you, Dr. Mahajan, uh, right up your, your area of, of specialization. Should a CT scan be repeated after eight weeks? The CT, previous CT was 18 by 25. Uh, should it be repeated to see if it is getting better? And how many times should you repeat the CT? Like, when do you need to get the CT if you have COVID? Um, and when should you repeat it? 
okay let me let me start from the beginning see if you have mild disease or are asymptomatic and that's 85% of all patients then you don't need a ct scan unless you go further and if your oxygen saturation falls below 94 that's when you should get a ct scan the problem which was happening was that the day someone got a positive rt pcr report they would just want to get a ct scan done that was unnecessary and because of that many many unnecessary ct scans uh, have been done during this wave now when the oxygen saturation falls that's when you do the ct you can know from the ct scan that whether you have mild moderate or severe involvement of the lung and that is useful because it kind of triages as to what kind of therapy you need do you need hospital admission or not below 90 definitely you need a ct scan of course again i will repeat what i keep saying every time that we have to treat the patient we don't have to treat the ct scan or the blood test reports or what have you everything has to be taken holistically and so a ct in isolation is not the only thing now someone who had 18 by 25 ct severity score means he was in severe involvement of the lung does he need a repeat ct scan or not this will again be dictated by whether he made a uneventful recovery or whether from 18 he worsened whether he needed icu care whether he was put on a ventilator or not and whether after he recovered he still having breathlessness he still having chest pain or he continues to have other problems based on that your physician will decide whether you need a repeat ct scan or not it may be as early if you are still breathless still getting worse it may be as early as 2 weeks 4 weeks which would happen in a minuscule minority of cases or in the long term if someone wants to know whether there are residual changes in the lung whether there is fibrosis which has happened which may have long term connotations then generally what is said unless there is any need to do it earlier which again your physician will decide it should be done at 3 months following recovery to know what is going on in the lungs but again i'll say every person who is recovered from a serious disease doesn't need a repeat ct scan if you've recovered uneventfully and you're doing your day to day work very well you don't need a repeat ct scan it's a minority of cases where the symptoms persist or where breathlessness persists who will need a repeat ct scan to see what is happening to the lungs and whether something needs to be done of course in the acute stage also if you are developing fibrosis or going towards that level there are certain drugs available i mean it's still not clear how much they are helping because it's just remember this disease has been around only 15 months but yeah. those anti yeah. uh, uh, fibrosis drugs may be given and that's where a repeat ct may be need to done uh, to be done earlier but generally okay. if you want to see the long term effects it's at 3 months okay so that's the definitive word on cts by perhaps a leading radiologist in in india maybe even in the world uh, you know he's it's a man behind hajima behind hajima imaging and therefore that's the definitive word dr sir let me get you in on that though let me tell you what i think is the dilemma i'm i'm seeing some of the questions coming in i tell you what i i think is the dilemma that many people are grappling with first wave of covid it is all pretty clear it's mild watch your oxygen saturation drop if your oxygen saturation starts to drop go to hospital maybe get on to steroids and life proceeds that's what the theory used to be now what seems to be happening is that some people seem to be getting concerned a will i be able to get a hospital bed should i be doing it early and one of the ways to find out whether i will need to be uh, getting a hospital bed let me go ahead and get a ct done earlier also then this entire question of should i start steroids or should i not start steroids because there are some people who are saying i waited too long to start a dexamethasone some people are saying you started it too early and it hurt you and therefore people will say that you need to do things like cts to find that out uh, what's the current thinking Uh, on the protocol because this wave has been slightly different this variant also has been slightly different 
Vikram, I agree with Harsh completely. I mean, he spelled it out very nicely. And uh, I'm also from that school of thought that you should do a CT scan perhaps on day seven or, or further on into the disease, especially if it's going to make a difference to the management. There's no point just doing a CT scan for the heck of it, you know, just to find out what the disease status is. So I think that if things are getting better by day six, seven, there is probably no need for it. When I say better, that means the oxygenation is good. There is no cough, there is no fever. But if there is persistent cough or fever at day seven, majority of the people, that means the COVID specialists would advise a CT scan. And that's when I think it should be done. And then when the grading happens on that, then it becomes a different story. I mean, if there is uh, moderate to severe damage on the CT scan, then majority of the people would like to repeat it once early and once at three months, like Harsh said. So I think that uh, within public knowledge, it's enough to tell them that if you're having fever and cough and or breathlessness, low saturation at se day seven onwards, that's the time to go for it. But you should already be in touch with a COVID physician and they are going to tell you when to do it and whether or not to do it. Okay, fair enough. Now, um, on the question of the medication and treatment, seeing as we are discussing that, uh, Dr. Mahajan, what is the latest theory which is coming out in the entire industry around things like, uh, you know, we've, we've had now plasma therapy being discontinued by the by ICMR. A lot of controversy about ivermectin, whether it should be given, whether it shouldn't be given, uh, what the, the, whether when steroids should be given, if at all. What's your latest view on this? And what seems to be the established uh, view around treatment? See, uh, Vikram, the one drug or two drugs which really help in this disease, one is oxygen and the other is, uh, uh, you know, steroids, dexamethasone. But having said that, you know, dexamethasone is not something or steroids are not something which the patient can start on their own. So it has to be remembered that you are not anyone to start these uh, steroids. These are not even, uh, you know, off the uh, shelf kind of uh, drugs. You shouldn't be able to get your hands on it also as uh, a, a lay person. It's only on doctor's prescription that you get it. That's point number one. Point number two, do remember that except for a minority of situations, where your physician can decide whether to start the steroids early, you do not want to start the steroids in the viral replication stage. While the you know infection is still on and is progressive, which is seven, eight days, even till 10 days, you may have viral replication. And so what is happening and what has been cautioned by the experts that if you start at day four, five, six, it can make your situation worse. Actually, steroids can, uh, uh, you know, fire the replication and increase the viral replication and make the infection much worse than what it would have otherwise been. What is the real role of steroids is that they, once your inflammatory response from the body, the immune response actually comes and that is what is taking over. That is what is, uh, you know, filling the lungs up. That is what is causing uh, 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 problems in the body. That's when the steroids have to be given. And they are very, very helpful in taking care of this inflammatory immune response, which comes. And uh, this is where, this is one drug which actually saves lives. Now, as okay. far as, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, plasma therapy goes, see, plasma therapy is that you are injecting someone else's antibodies into another person. And when do these antibodies work? They work at the beginning of the infection, just like the monoclonal antibodies that have now become available in this country also, but which were something which was always available in the U.S., in fact, President Trump recovered very fast because of these monoclonal antibodies. These work in the beginning stages of the infection. This is just like, you know, you get vaccinated, you develop antibodies, you get infected, you only get a mild disease because there are antibodies already fighting. In the later stages of the disease, actually, that is when 
the plasma therapy has been used it has been found not to be of any okay. use it should not have been of any use theoretically and uh, you know now uh, even icmr That's has uh, discontinued it so uh, right. you know no One point rushing around trying to find plasma don't rush around trying to find plasma only helpful in a particular period of the disease that's very important now dr sain something else that people are running around trying to get the hands on is tocilizumab uh, i'm going to eventually get that correct and who better to talk about it than you you're probably the leading expert in the country on that particular drug because you were the the national lead investigator on tocilizumab uh, here, here in the country tell us all about this when should it be taken and presumably it should only be taken um in really severe cases so that's after hospitalization in really severe cases and it certainly should not be as somebody was was doing on twitter a day or two back then both you and i had to intervene was trying to consider taking it for black fungus which obviously they shouldn't have tell us about this drug so before i tell you about tocilizumab uh, i just like to summarize the steroid usage mild yeah. disease which is 80 which is 85 to 90% of the cases do not need any steroids occasionally if they have a bad cough and fever day 5 to day 10 they can take some inhalational steroids buticort by nebulizer but otherwise you don't need oral or intravenous steroids in mild disease for patients who have moderate disease who which carries on into the second week especially in hospitals moderate doses of 5 to 10 days of steroids is what is needed there is no need to carry on beyond that there is no need to give high doses only in 2 to 3% of the severe cases especially the people who land up being in icu before ventilator or even if they get on the ventilator is there a role for higher doses of steroids given for a long term that means 3 to 4 weeks and it is because of abuse and overuse of steroids that people are landing up with the mucor infection which we'll probably talk about a little later and in the midst of all this there is use for blood thinners that's also recommended and the third drug that helps specific patients in specific situations is tocilizumab now when to use tocilizumab the best time to use it is as soon as they get into severe covid disease which by icmr is defined as oxygenation of less than 90% and if they have raised inflammatory markers like ferritin crp il6 and that's the time to give tocilizumab but you have to make sure that there is no super added additional infection in that patient as you're administering it and it's ideally given before the patient with severe covid goes on the ventilator so it's that specific time point if we have if we would have, if we would have uh, used tocilizumab carefully only in selected patients in whom it is indicated we wouldn't have actually been running short of it i think tocilizumab has also been overused and if it is used in every moderate and severe patient obviously we're going to have an artificial shortage which we have and also you're going to create many more secondary infections so it may actually do more harm than good so you know your covid physician especially the ones who are treating you in hospitals will decide when to use it and that's when you should be looking for it otherwise not so just just again to hear it from you because as i said very few people know this particular drug better than you do So let me just get it straight from you. Even for prescribing okay. physicians, so I'll I'll repeat that. So, physicians yeah, don't repeat know. That. So when yep. should a physician prescribe it? Sure, sure. So tocilizumab is good for patients who have severe disease, early severe disease. That means they have just gotten onto a oxygen saturation of less than ninety percent, and they they are still not on the ventilator. So they have other modes of uh, oxygenation going on, non-invasive ventilation going on. they have high inflammatory markers on blood testing which means crp il6 and ferritin and they do not have any super added infection so called sepsis that's the kind of patient that needs tocilizumab and tocilizumab will benefit such patients and save lives okay i think that's clear enough so hopefully doctors watching this have also got a very clear sense of when it should be given and therefore when it should not be given Dr. Majan, I'm just going to turn to this question of black fungus that is really occupying everyone's attention. So here's a question from PK saying, 
uh, you know, there are a large number of positive cases uh, uh, in places like Kerala and that fungus, 300 cases in Hyderabad, uh, although there are not that many reported uh, COVID cases out there. Is the medical fraternity perhaps missing something in this? Is it entirely because of diabetes and, and COVID and some of those factors that we're talking about? Could it also be a hygiene issue with the amount of people who are, this is a sort of a added question that I'm also throwing in. Could it be because of humidifiers and the use of tap water there and uh, lack of hygiene in oxygen pipes? Uh, well, uh, you know, this comes from fungal spores, which are in the air. It doesn't come from water. So it, it may be that in the constraint environments of an ICU, which is, you know, sharing the air conditioning, multiple patients. So in that same ICU, multiple people may get it. But ultimately, there has to be underlying, you know, it generally happens in those who are diabetic and uncontrolled diabetes. Also, those who are in steroids, because steroids actually up the sugar levels to 400, 500 in, in diabetics. And uh, actually, people who've been having long-term steroids on their own, maybe diabetics, they become at much higher risk of developing uh, uh, mucormycosis. And uh, so it, it may not be so much personal hygiene, I don't think, because if that had been the case, then, you know, uh, it, we would have always had mucormycosis uh, of large numbers uh, in uh, our ICUs or in our wards, which is not the case. It, it, is ra it used to be rather the exception than the rule. And, and so uh, uh, this is something which is life-threatening and uh, it has to be treated very aggressively. And just as it want in our country, now you don't get amphotericin B, which is one of the drugs used for treating this, because suddenly it has disappeared. And it's not only because of uh, the fact that the numbers are high and maybe the production doesn't keep uh, pace, but also because people have started hoarding it for that rainy day when they might need it. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I think uh, the immunocompromised uh, patients, the diabetic, and someone who's on uh, a combination of things on high-dose steroids with very high sugar levels, uh, these are uh, really the uh, patients who develop uh, mucormycosis. And we are seeing nearly an epidemic of this, uh, and, and definitely in patients who have COVID. Right, uh, Dr. Sain, let me just quickly throw that to you as well. Do you, you really think there's a possibility uh, that people are getting it from things like oxygen pipes or anything else? So is there entirely steroid diabetes? So I think there are uh, a lot of factors that can cause it. Uh, as a transplant surgeon, I have looked after immunocompromised and immunosuppressed patients uh, for the last good part of 30 years. And But, you know, Vikram, we used to see it once or twice a year. Now we're seeing it so much more often. So obviously, it's a triangle, which I've also tweeted about a couple of days ago, between the COVID, diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes, and overuse or abuse of steroids. There are other minor factors like uh, oxygen therapy being administered in an unhygienic condition, either because of uh, infected tubes or masks or, you know, dirty water. Yes, and of course, poor orodental hygiene is also a factor. So I think, but these are, like Harsh said, these are minor factors. The major factors are steroids and diabetes. And they, what happens with steroids is the diabetes gets worse because obviously the sugars go up. And um, the steroids themselves are given in varying doses. So if they're given in mild to moderate doses, then the sugars are easy to control. But they've been giving, if they're given in very high doses, then the sugars become very difficult to control. And people who are diabetics will need insulin for uh, to, to manage these sugars in hospitals. And people who are not even diabetics, but if they've had high dose of steroids, even they become diabetics, at least temporarily. You know, their sugars will be high for a couple of weeks as long as they're getting steroids. So okay. one fuels the other. And, and when you have high blood sugars and when you have steroids going on, which are like immunosuppressive, that's the time that there is this fungal infection. It's called an opportunistic infection. Why? Because in the regular course, in normal people who have good immunity, it doesn't happen. It only happens to people who are immunosuppressed. And in this particular case, it's the high dose of steroids and excessive sugars 
that create the ideal medium for this fungus to grow. All right, a couple of final questions. Dr. Mahajan, this is for you. Is the oxygen crisis over now? And do the hospitals, have they been able to figure out how to put oxygen plants and other things so that we are not going to return to the oxygen crisis? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. In some parts of the country, the oxygen crisis is over right now because the number of cases have gone down. But the infrastructure is... It's it's very difficult to do it overnight. You know, we have these oxygen generators which can be locally fixed in hospitals as some that have been donated, say, from France and some other countries which are already functional in few of the hospitals. But India needs uh, many, many more. I think the central government has ordered 500 plus. Every state government is ordering. And these generators actually get fixed within hospitals and get attached to their oxygen supply and from the air they are able to extract oxygen uh, you know take out the nitrogen uh, uh, remember that 21 percent uh, of oxygen is there in the air and the rest is nearly all uh, nitrogen it's able to separate but these also during the covid crisis when we were uh, you know when hospitals were full with covid patients these generators would be able to supply about 10-15% of the need of the hospital. So the balance would still come through the routes that are known through uh, oxygen supply tanks and all of that. When COVID goes down, the good part about these generators is that it's not that you don't use them any longer. They will still continue to function and be able to uh, supply about 40-50% of the need of the hospital. But where, just as an electricity generator provides you a backup when electricity fails, where this will be very important, especially if we actually have a big third wave. I hope it doesn't happen. We only have a ripple and not a wave. But if that were to come, then these would plug those gaps when, you know, you saw in uh, several hospitals around the country where for two, two hours or three hours, the oxygen didn't reach in time and patients died. That will not happen if you have these generators, but it will still take the country at least four to 12 weeks incrementally to get more of these uh, fixed in hospitals. And then I think to a large extent, the crisis would be overcome. The third wave, I'm just trying to understand this. Even if there's a third wave, you feel that we will not have that, those pictures of people running around with oxygen cylinders, begging, people dying because oxygen is running out. Um, you, you're fairly confident that that phase is not going to come back now, Dr. Maja. I, I'm, I'm confident of that as far as hospitals are concerned. And also you see so many concentrators, oxygen concentrators, which can be used at home. Uh, coming okay. into the country, people are buying it. So you have the home getting taken care of by oxygen concentrators, which generally can give you five liters of oxygen per minute. Whereas uh, when you need more than that, then you better be in a hospital. And hopefully in the coming months, the hospitals would also have their own supplies, at least enough to be able to tide over those times when there may be a shortage. All right, I'm going to try and sneak one more question in for you, Dr. Soen. This comes from my DHM that they're asking about liver. We know about the long-term impacts that COVID has got on the lungs, on various other aspects. What's the long-term effect, if you've seen any, on the liver? So, uh, first of all, liver, kidneys, and a few other organs of the body also have the same receptors. Receptors means... Uh, there are protein molecules on the surface of cells which can actually attach virus. So liver has the same receptor as the lung tissue does. So yes, the virus can attach itself in the liver. But thankfully, in most of the cases, the liver function is only very modestly affected. So you may have a little rise in bilirubin and transaminases, which is SGOT, SGPT. So if you do a liver function test, then you may have a slight elevation, slight uh, abnormality in liver tests. But the people who really bear the brunt of uh, COVID among my set of patients 
are the people who already have a liver disease. So if somebody has mild liver disease, they, that can become severe. And if somebody has severe liver disease, what we call decompensated liver disease, which means liver disease with complications, then there is a 20% chance of such people dying from COVID. So you can, you can understand because that's basically a severe comorbidity. So in fact, I've been now telling patients with decompensated liver disease to go ahead and have a transplant. Because once you have had the transplant, you no longer have the, have the organ failure. And therefore, the comorbidity is much less with a transplant than with a bad liver disease. All right, Dr. Soin, Dr. Mahajan, thank you both so much for joining us. I think you really helped clarify so many issues that have obviously been bothering people and they are out there. Uh, it was great for both of you to join us. Thank you so much. We'll try and get you back. Hopefully, the worst is behind us, at least in the second wave, and things will start getting better. We can only cross our fingers and pray for that. By the way, if you want to watch any of the previous episodes, I'm once again going to repeat this because we've had Dr. Maharaj and Dr. Swain with us earlier, and a number of other issues have been discussed at great length. We can't cover every single topic on every episode of Ask the Doctor. So do watch some of the previous episodes. You can just get the Editor G app, and uh, it's available out there. Or previous episodes are available right here on Twitter. So that's Ask the Doctor for now. We'll be back again tomorrow evening. Do continue to send in your questions. If there's anything that you want to know, this is your best chance to get the best medical advice from the top doctors in the country and around the world. Bye for now.